If you encountered the psychotic, cannibalistic embodiments of childhood horror known as Winnie the Pooh and Piglet while out in the woods with your friends, what would you do? Maria and her gaggle of girlfriends just wanted to head out to the Hundred Acre Woods to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday city life, where they don't have to worry about stalkers, exers, or the lingering trauma of either. Instead, they pick a vacation spot where people routinely disappear and mutilated bodies are found with alarming regularity. Do they take any precautions? No. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Hundred Acre Gang in Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Our twisted fairy tale begins with a narrated animation. While wandering in the Hundred Acre Wood, the boy called Christopher Robin came across hybrid abominations that called themselves Owl, Rabbit, Eeyore, Piglet, and Winnie the Pooh. Christopher Robin fed them, accidentally forcing them to become dependent on him, and when he grew up and left to become a doctor, they starved. When the worst of winter came and hunger gnawed at their bones, they betrayed Eeyore, killing him and consuming his flesh. Now feral with madness, they swore never to speak human language again and turned their hatred towards Christopher Robin and the rest of humanity for abandoning them. Hardcore. But seriously, which one of you overall wearing midnight barn these monstrosities into being. It definitely wasn't me. Chris should have known leaving them behind for college would require at least the same amount of preparation and forethought as leaving a cat behind to go on vacation. In this era of Amazon one day shipping, he could have at least sent a supply drop or two to tide them over through the harsh winter. If Chris didn't care enough to do that, then why come back at all? But seriously, get your together, Pooh. Chris was a kid too for sake. Where were all your beastly parents this whole time? I don't see you taking out your wrath on bears, rabbits, owls, donkeys, and pigs. Years later, grown-up Christopher Robin brings his fiance Mary to visit the Hundred Acre Wood. He wants her to meet the lovable creatures he called friends when he was a kid. But he's disappointed when she uses her kindergarten voice to reassure him that she still loves his imagination, even though he probably made Winnie and the gang up. Oof. All that healthy love and support ain't gonna be enough for Christopher. He guides her deeper and deeper into the woods. When he hears the hoot of an owl, he rushes headlong into an ominous tunnel formed out of dead trees. At the end, they enter a hillbilly encampment straight out of deliverance. Look, you're not in any danger, okay? I know them. Famous last words. There's blood on the honey pots and glass everywhere, dude. I know my friends, but I don't barge into their homes after going years without talking, expecting them to welcome me with open arms. Did you think to right first? Maybe send a gift basket and warn them that you were coming. Whenever you're visiting wild animals you used to share some sort of mind meld with, it's always a good idea to tuck a 10 millimeter Glock in your backpack, just in case they forgot who daddy was. Or, you know, or that daddy left all those years ago. Despite Mary's rising discomfort and the still smoking campfire that suggests someone is nearby, Chris breaks into Pooh's treehouse. They discover a picture of Chris and his face scratched out. Not a great sign. Heavy footsteps send them into hiding as the nightmare known as Pooh lays down for a nap. Pooh seems a bit more serial killery than I remember, and a lot bigger. Instead of stealth crouching out the door immediately and hiring a group of mercenary hunters to eliminate nature's abominations, they hide until well past nightfall. The trailer park by day has become the trailer park by night. A terrifying lost boys camp full of dead animal skulls and bunker supplies. Despite being scared enough to hide under a bed for hours, they failed their stealth mission immediately. It's like they're trying to stand directly in bright spotlights and yell at each other from three feet away. Animal sounds surround them, and Mary alerts the entire camp to their presence before Piglet wraps a length of heavy chain around her throat and begins to crush it from behind. Chris goes for Piglet, but gets tossed aside like a toy. Please, Mary! I got an idea. Why don't you shut the up and do something? Piglet's clearly not heeding your warning. Instead of delivering a fast kick to Piglet's knees or from behind, or even just jumping on Piglet's back and gouging his eyes out while his hands are busy, Chris watches Piglet half decapitate Mary and learns a valuable lesson. Never meet your childhood heroes. He runs for the tree tunnel to sob like the useless little she is. Great idea, running back into Pooh's home where it's close quarters with lots of dead ends. It's not like there's a perfectly open forest, which you know like the back of your hand, that leads to safety or anything. Pooh and Piglet are fat as 
now. Shouldn't be hard for a skinny dude such as yourself to outrun them. Pooh and Piglets corner him, and in the bleakest cartoon since Salad Fingers, we see what happened to poor old Christopher Robin. Pooh and Piglet show him the cannibalized corpse of Eeyore before they burn Chris alive. Turns out, everything up to this point was just the prologue to Pooh's vendetta against humanity. Through voiceover during the credits, we learn that what seems like dozens of people have gone missing in the Hundred Acre Woods recently. Mutilated bodies are piling up, and tabloids are reporting sightings of Pooh's crew on the daily. So, is anybody handling this? Or have Pooh and his friends become the Bigfoots of England? The entire United Kingdom is smaller than the state of Oregon. Someone is investigating these disappearances, right? Christopher Robin may have been a socially starved man-child, but he did have a family, and so did Mary, right? I guess we'll never know. We cut to Maria, a college student with the worst luck in the world, after Chris and Mary. She's been struggling recently in her life, after narrowly surviving a stalker attack a few months ago. No matter what she does or where she goes, she's still reliving the fear. In crowds, walking alone, noises jack up her heart rate, and phantom sightings out of the corner of her eye leave her paranoid. Apparently, the stalker was never caught, so it makes total sense to worry that he's still out there lurking in the shadows. Her therapist suggests a holiday away somewhere safe, isolated and quiet, where she can clear her head. Hmm, I wonder where she's going to go. Certainly not that very famous forest where people are getting shanked on the regular. That would be crazy. Maria and her pals head out to the open road. The Hundred Acre Wood has had a haircut. Loggers have hacked their way through large swaths of it, but not enough to fully expose the darkness lurking within. Which is a little odd considering 100 acres is only 0.156 of a square mile, meaning average healthy adults could walk through this forest in five minutes. At the English version of that gas station from Cabin in the Woods, Maria stops for a refill. Sure, the pumps don't work and the windows are broken and covered in weird magazine clippings, but let's take a wander inside. What's the worst that could happen to a girl with heightened adrenaline and a history of freaking out when men sneak up on her? Turns out, the garage isn't as deserted as it seems. I don't think there's anyone here. I swear to God, everyone in this movie has the most theatrical timing. She woke this dude from a pile of old rags. Maria and her crew of city girls, Jessica, Alice, Zoe, and Laura, arrive at their gothic Airbnb. Charming. The staircase gives it a fourth floor walk-up kind of vibe. They waste no time making themselves at home. Did she bring a pink light with her on vacation? Or did the host of this house install an Amsterdam red light in this room? I will say, the filmmaker sure does know his audience. Jessica forces everyone to fork over their phones so they can disconnect for the weekend, which would make sense anywhere without a recent history of disappearances and murders. Hmm, could there be something else that they're forgetting? Oh right, there's a sixth friend. Tina, that couldn't wake up in time to jump into a car built for five people. Well, hope she knows where she's going. Can you call me as soon as you get this? Because I have no clue where I'm going. Tina ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer. She is stupid lost. The kind of lost where you abandoned your working car on a road with perfectly fine cell reception to wander into the woods, where the blood bear's waiting for her. She drops her phone, because of course she does, and then does her best 80s whore bimbo impression. Five out of seven. She slides under a broken garage door and hides behind a wood chipper instead of reaching for literally any of the many heavy objects within arm's reach she could use to defend herself with. Despite being the size of the mountain, who's apparently been working on his stealth game, his teleporting ninja silently slips past the broken garage door, sneaks up on Tina, and bludgeons her repeatedly before feeding her headfirst into the wood chipper. Do you think he's gonna feed that slop to Piglet? Well, waste not, want not. Back at the Adams family Airbnb, Laura steals her phone back, and Maria forces her friends into a group session to tell us more about her stalker situation. She says she could spidey sense him in her life, watching from the shadows, until one night he broke into her house and assaulted her. Despite Despite catching him and calling the cops, he was never caught. For her sake, I hope her spider tingle still works. And the Lost Boys camp from 
Piglet cycles to jumpstart the generator, while Pooh toys with, wait, Christopher Robin is still alive? The betrayal. It's like you can't even trust hyper-violent animated fanfiction anymore. Christopher begs Pooh to stop and apologizes for abandoning him. The big guy's almost bowled over with golden flashbacks of Christopher as a cherubic child. A honey-thick tear streaks for his eye. For a moment, it seems like he might just let Christopher go. Nah, just with you. Pooh uses Eeyore's tail to lash Christopher's back to pieces. He props up Mary's cannibalized skeleton to watch and pipes her blood through a showerhead over Christopher. God damn. A little later, Pooh is busy dragging Mary's corpse around the woods like a rag doll, as you do, when he hears Laura's house music. A totally spontaneous, not at all gratuitous selfie session is taking place in the jacuzzi. But it's only when Laura goes to review her photos that she sees him behind her. The image of Pooh in that shot is crystal clear. Dude isn't even smudged or blurry. This isn't like taking a photo of dirty clothes piled on a chair in the dark and mistaking it for a demon. There is nothing nearby that you could misinterpret as anything other than a six foot tall peeping poo in overalls. Laura calls out into the darkness, accusing whatever she saw of being Maria's stalker. But even if it is, how would that be any better? It's time to head inside, alert our friends, lock all the doors, call England's emergency number 999, call whatever detective was assigned to Maria's stalker case back in the day, and prepare to go home. Now, we know it's the honey guzzler himself on the prowl, not just some dude with a mask on, so simple stalker protocol won't cut it, but these common sense first steps will also help them in their defense against the poo. Even though her story sounds a little crazy, you know Maria's gonna believe her. So if Laura had come inside and warned her friends, they could have secured the house, possibly a room close to their car with a single small window where they could hold up in an emergency, fight together if need be, and then escape if they must. Unfortunately, Laura wasn't blessed much in the way of common sense. After a quick holler and making making sure to turn on the atmospheric strobe light. She, no joke, dips back into the tub with her back to where the stalker was and closes her eyes. In a totally unforeseen turn of events, the stalker she just saw, AKA Pooh and Piglet, ambush her. Laura wakes in the driveway, bound and gagged. Somehow, Pooh and Piglet apparated Maria's car keys into their possession. Pooh drives forward and crushes Laura's head with the tire. Maria and Jessica hear Laura's screams and arrive to find her headless body, blood still pumping from the root. Despite the front door of their Airbnb standing completely open, they rush inside and find Alice and Zoe and some personalized graffiti waiting for them. You could have just said so, Jesus. There was no need to do a burnout on our friend's face. Whoever it is, probably wrote that. Sherlock Holmes, everybody. Zoe tells him they have to stick together and find a weapon, right before glass shatters upstairs. Outside, Pooh wanders by with a machete and his own personal air force, a swarm of bees that obey his every command. The lights inside shut off. Come on, come on, come on. Welp. So much for sticking together. Panic makes us do desperate things. I don't blame this group for being confused, uncertain, and unprepared for any of this. They don't know this house or this legend of the Hundred Acre Gang, and they have no way of knowing how many of them are outside. I'd suggest running as a group, but you know they'd be breaking their ankles on every tree root in this forest. The first step here should be to move together to the kitchen and gather weapons. Knives can level the playing field against stronger attackers. A weak punch won't do much to poo, but a weak jab with a sharp blade to the throat will kill. It ain't much, but it's better than nothing if you're cornered. With those in hand, move as a group up the stairs to a bedroom with a single window, one they can lock and then barricade. As far as we know, they have perfectly fine cell reception out here, so they should be on their phones to police within seconds of barricading the door. Whoever the intruders are, they murdered Laura in cold blood, so there is no reasoning with them. No assuming the best. Ideally, it would be great to hide until the cavalry arrives. If the intruders reach the barricaded door, the next step is to have someone with a long knife lay down and see if they can stab it in the intruder's foot through the bottom crack of the door. This'll help slow them down if we have to run for it. Maintain that barricade at all costs. Make sure that if they get inside, it's because they jack torrents themselves through the hardwood first. If they do, that gives you a good murder hole to take out an eye or better if they peer inside. But never let your get within grabbing reach. Force 
them to reach in for the doorknob on your side. Then bloodlet them. If they come to the window by crawling on the roof, be prepared to charge them when they're most vulnerable, right when they're about to climb inside. And no superficial cuts. We're going for a full decapitation here. It's the only way to be sure. Zoe and Alice bolt off to find weapons in the kitchen while Maria freezes in the hallway. She thinks this must be the work of her stalker. Zoe and Alice return with a hammer and what looks like a garden tool from the kitchen. Okay, well, thanks for bringing back some weapons for the rest of us. Zoe remembers. Laura went to the pool and probably left the back door wide open. She and Alice run off to secure it, and Maria suddenly realizes she brought a gun with her for the weekend. How is this not the first thing you thought to pull out? I just hope this isn't the first time you've shot it. When they return to the hall, who has gained access to the house? He stalks from room to room looking for them. Uh, pretty sure he can hear you. He's 10 feet away and has the ears of a predator. Jesus, she's like that annoying person in a movie theater commenting the whole time. Except, this time, someone's trying to kill you. It's a shame Maria clearly went to zero firing ranges with that gun. One good shot to the head would probably lay Poo out. But yeah, I'm betting she's never pulled a trigger in her life. Zoe and Alice find the pool room, where they tiptoe all of four feet before Piglet suddenly ambushes them through an open side window. Piglet backhands Alice to the deck as Zoe falls into the pool. He staggers towards Alice as if to finish her off while Zoe delivers commentary from the water. It's at this point you can really see the budget on screen. Holy stop trying to run in water. It's called swimming and it is a a lot faster. Not to mention the pool's all of five feet wide, so just get out. Looks like we got another Christopher Robin on our hands. And to think, had anyone just waltzed up to Pooh, put the gun barrel center mass from five feet away, and pulled the trigger, they could have ended this nightmare pretty much immediately. But no, no, just watch as the hill piggy caves your girlfriend's head in with a mallet. Apparently, Piglet's got a kink. Instead of going after the easy kill laying at his feet, he starts throwing his murder chain at the pool like he's afraid Zoe might drown in it. And Zoe, what the f are you doing? Why the f are you dunking yourself instead of getting out and smashing one of the literal dozens of windows behind you to escape? Dear God, these characters are so stupid. Piglet drops the chain and goes for the mallet. Then he gets in the water to chase Zoe? <laughs> I can't make this shit up. I'm sure the director had a bigger pool in mind, but you gotta adapt your scene to fit your resources. This is ridiculous. Again, take a few steps to the side and jump out, or just swim. You are surrounded by exits. Get out of the pool and Kool-Aid man out of here. Are you at least going to get out when you reach the edge of the pool? That's a no. Hey, Alice, you, you gonna get up while his back is turned? You gonna try running or something while he slow drags himself through the water towards you? Please, tell me you're gonna do something. Nope. Alice just gives up and lays down. A real Ellen Ripley. These monsters have a weakness. Their speed. If you can outrun them, there's no way that they're keeping up. Doggy paddling in a pool, stopping, playing dead, hiding, or trying to fight them is only going to result in you filling up the blood shower reservoir. Alice should have her weird thick garden dagger in her hand underneath her, poised to strike as soon as he turns her over. And by strike, I mean prison shank him a hundred times. The goal here is that no one should be able to tell how many times you actually stabbed them. Then, take his mallet and give him the old Annie Wilkes special before you roll him into the pool, face down. If she's lucky and he swings her over his shoulder without turning her first, she should plunge the tool into the back of his neck so it has the highest chance of severing his spine and incapacitating him long enough to land the killing blows. And I mean lots of killing blows. There is literally no benefit to be had from letting him take you to a secondary location. She has everything she needs right here to turn this little piggy into ground poor. Maria and Jessica arrive just in time to see Pooh carrying Alice's unconscious body into the woods. They follow the abominations back to their fort, but hesitate to shoot in case they might hurt Alice. <laughs> Yeah, no. Alice is for sure already hurt beyond repair, at least mentally. Pro tip, 
When you wake up after getting knocked out by an attacker, don't alert them that you're awake and ready to be tortured by immediately loudly struggling and crying. <laughs> Clench your fist, bite your lip, shut that up. Oh god, it's like xenomorph drool. At least it's not corrosive. The other girls have f***ed off to who knows where, giving Pooh ample time to slap the Get out of Alice as we fade to black. When we return, Maria and Jess have materialized from nowhere to free Alice. Pooh's hearing is so good that a few minutes ago, he snapped to attention when a single drop of spit fell two inches from Alice's mouth to the deck. But sure, he can't hear your boots and very loud idle chatter now. With stealth out the window, one of you needs to turn around with that gun in your hand to watch for teleporting childhood nightmares while the other unties Alice. They're halfway to the tree tunnel when a screech rings out through the camp. It stops them cold in their tracks. Maria makes the split-second decision that they can't leave someone else to suffer if they're trapped here. Jeremy Goldberg once said, courage is knowing that it might hurt and doing it anyway. Stupidity is the same. That's why life is hard. I can applaud Maria's naive bravery here. It's her entire character arc. She's refusing to let the fear chasing her dictate her actions in the future. That's a good thing. A great thing. If you survive long enough to make it to your next therapy session gets complicated when you're not just risking your own life, but your friends' lives too. Then, bravery is a group decision. Both Jess and Alice want to get the hell out of a hundred acre woods. And who can blame them? You've got one gun between you, and none of you know how to shoot the thing. You were catatonic not 15 minutes ago, Maria. That doesn't exactly inspire confidence. What are you doing? Put me back in a minute, okay? We need to leave now. That's rich. I'm sure you'd have been understanding if your friend said the same thing and left while you were tied up earlier. Right, Alice? Maria very slowly tiptoes up to Christopher Robin's body where it's hanging from a rafter. Right as they cut him down, another woman calls out for help. Chris tells them he can fend for himself. Clearly. So the girls run off to save the next distraction. Nearby, they find a woman battered and chained, her neck in a noose. She begs for help. Instead, her saviors sit down for a heart-to-heart -heart over crumpets and tea. Oh, How about who the f cares, Jess? How about we unleash and unchain the captive, get in the car, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and chat about homicidal man-bear pigs in the safety of a crowded pub acres and acres away from the Hundred Acre Wood? What have they done to you? You do have eyes, Maria. You can see what they've done to her. Do you need any more incentive to get the hell out of here any quicker? They finally unshackle her from chains, which she easily could have been able to slip herself. Just look how loose those are. But just a few seconds later, she catches a glimpse of herself in a mirror and begins to scream. She grabs Maria's gun, threatening revenge. Great. Now a weak, half-blind, mentally unstable victim stole your gun and is drawing your torment to your location. She calls out to Piglet without checking the gun first, firing wildly for no particular reason before Piglet appears wrapped in chains and screeches at her. Instead of firing again, she decides to monologue instead. I'm gonna make you pay. How about you shoot? You shoot him now. Why the f are you monologuing? Just kill him already. Oh no, who didn't see that coming? But seriously, one bullet? Maria, you brought one bullet to protect you from your stalker, and nobody bothered to check if there was ammo in the gun. Oh my f god. She backs up right into Pooh. Then Piglet comes around and crushes her neck with his favorite toy. The girls haven't spoken for several minutes, so they pick this moment to fill their quota, alerting the Hundred Acre gang to their presence. Pooh gives chase. Maria and Jess run away, but Alice is too slow, so she hides, finding Piglet's mallet sitting within reach. When Piglet comes too close, Alice lands a solid blow to his face, knocking him out of frame. Please tell me you're gonna triple tap him now. This is a golden opportunity to finish him off quickly and help your friends. Who catches up to Maria and Jess in the tree tunnel? Despite having an entire camp set up with electricity and building this tunnel out of super dry wood, it only makes sense that the tunnel is lit by torch fire. Maria uses it to keep Pooh at bay for about four seconds. Don't you dare put that torch down, Maria. Don't you- God- 
While the girls run blindly through the darkened forest, Alice is embracing her inner Piglet back at the camp. With Piglet tied up in his own chains, Alice taunts him that he's not going anywhere. Then she gives him three hard whacks with a mallet, finishing him off with an overhead slam. Finally, someone's acting in their own best interest. But let's be real here. She ain't strong enough to drag Piglet around anywhere, nor prop him up, nor chain him. Should have just hammer timed his head in and bounced. Or better yet, if you're bent on tying him up, used Piglet as bait, and ambushed Pooh when he comes back. But I'd say that's probably too risky. Okay, now that that's done, run Alice. There's still an apex predator out there hunting your friends. Gloat when you're home. And please, at least watch your back. Never mind. And you were doing so well. A real shame. Since they never had any survival instincts to begin with, Maria and Jess stumble upon the scene and scream, once again drawing Pooh's attention back to his murderous hunt for their heads. Jess remembers her British etiquette and pauses long enough for Pooh to catch up to them. So polite of her. They find a road and flog down a passing truck. Four drunk guys tumble out, mistaking the girls for drugged up lunatics when they start rambling about being chased by Winnie the Pooh. Suddenly, one guy notices something yellow standing in the road ahead of them. It's the poo. The girls jump in the truck while the guys gear up for a West Side Story street fight. Despite the girls screaming bloody murder that he's dangerous and they should just leave, they surround and bully him instead. Well, I guess it's time to open up a can of whoop -ass. It's at this point when you either pull a gun or run. Each armed with their favorite post-apocalyptic weapon of choice, the men land blow after blow. Who takes them all like a champ until the last of the men shatters a bottle over his head. <laughs> God. Dude's pimp hand is strong. Slice that guy's face clean off. Bottle guy rushes for the truck, exposing his mangled flesh to Maria and Jess. <laughs> How about we leave? Pooh takes off the second guy's hand with a single swipe, then pops his head like a pimple. Another pimp slap slices the ringleader's neck clean through. The last guy flees, but Pooh's air force of killer bees is on him before he reaches the corner. With that settled, Pooh lumbers towards the truck. Poor f sake, Maria. The keys were in the ignition the whole time. You should be long gone by now. Instead of speeding around him, Maria risks the truck stalling or high centering and speeds headlong into and over Pooh. Only a few seconds later, Pooh appears on the bumper. He climbs into the truck bed and onto the truck. Finally, Maria thinks to slam on the brakes, but somehow, despite not hitting a thing, Maria's maneuver ends with her slamming her head into the wheel and Pooh coherent enough to yank Jess from the truck and decapitate her while Maria's still disoriented. Right. It's Maria's turn next. Pooh hauls her from the truck and prepares to land the killing blow, right before she's rescued via deus ex machina by Christopher Robin. <laughs> Has anyone heard of seatbelts? Rule number one when committing vehicular manslaughter. Buckle up. Now you chop his head off to make sure he stays dead. Don't pansy out now, Chris. Pick up Pooh's knife and... <sighs> <laughs> Oh no, again, who didn't see that coming? Don't run, you fools. Chop his head off while he's still trapped. Who <laughs> gives Michael Myers a run for his money. Who takes hold of Maria again, and Christopher Robin makes a final plea for Maria's life. He begs Pooh to take him instead and let her live. But Pooh's got other axes to grind. He growls out a raspy, you live, and slices through Maria's throat. Chris mourns her death and runs off into the night as Pooh finishes Maria off for good and lives to tell Alan Rabbit all about the humans responsible for Piglet's death. Pooh may be strong and disturbing, but he's still made of flesh. Piglet's death proves they can be killed, especially if you keep a cool head, ambush them, and remember to decapitate them for good measure. Who got lucky this time? If he sticks to hunting the dumbest human beings in the Hundred Acre Wood, his bloodlust will go fully satisfied. But he's done the first time anyone with half a brain and a working backbone shows up to take him down. For those reasons, I think the Hundred Acre Gang from Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey was beaten. And remember, don't animals.